Good morning and welcome to the 11th annual Sacred Trust Talks and Book Signing event presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. I'm Cindy Small with the Gettysburg Foundation. The Gettysburg Foundation, the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service at Gettysburg, is pleased to collaborate with Gettysburg National Military Park to invite renowned Civil War historians, authors, National Park Service rangers, and licensed battlefield guides. Each year, they share their unique perspectives on the Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War with all of our visitors. Our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Varon, who will discuss Legacies of Appomattox, Lee's Surrender in History and Memory. General Robert E. Lee's surrender to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse evokes a highly gratifying image in the popular mind. It was, many believe, a moment that transcended politics, a moment of healing, a moment of patriotism, untainted by ideology. But Dr. Varon will present that this rosy image conceals a seething debate over precisely what the surrender meant and what kind of nation would emerge from the war. Dr. Varon is the Langborn M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia, a specialist in the Civil War era and 19th century South. Dr. Varon is the author of several books, including Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War, which won the 2014 Library of Virginia Literary Award for Nonfiction. She was awarded one of Civil War Monitor's Best Books of 2014. Dr. Varon's public presentations include book talks at the Lincoln Bicentennial in Springfield, at Gettysburg Civil War Institute, and on C-SPAN's Book TV. She is also a featured speaker in the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lectureship Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Varon. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to everyone. Is volume good? Everyone can hear me good. All right. So Lee's surrender to U.S. Grant. That's a familiar scene for most Americans. The two men meet in the parlor of Wilmer McLean in the modest central Virginia hamlet of Appomattox Courthouse. Lee is wearing a fine dress uniform and embodies the proud gentility of the South's planter elite. Grant is dressed casually in a mud-spattered uniform. He represents the hard scrabble farmers and wage earners he's molded into a formidable fighting machine. The two men awkwardly exchange some pleasantries about their service in the Mexican War. Turn up the volume, turn up the volume, folks. And, uh, and agree to the surrender terms that effectively end the Civil War. And in essence, Grant's terms set Lee's men free on, on their honor, the promise that they will never again take up arms against the United States. Grant's magnanimity in this hour, Lee's stoic resignation in defeat, not only reunite the North and South, but prepare the way for America's emergence as a world power. So this Appomattox story, as I've told in a nutshell here, is an edifying one. It's the story of Appomattox as a gentleman's agreement, a moment when these two iconic leaders rise above their hatreds and for the good of the country uh, they both love, they make peace. This gentleman's agreement version of Appomattox casts Appomattox as a moment that, uh, that transcended politics. But today I'm going to tell you an altogether different Appomattox story, and I'll try to suggest that what happened on April 9, 1865, is even more significant and fascinating than we have realized. I will argue that the surrender was an inherently political moment, one that would set the terms of an unfolding debate about the meaning of the war. Lee and Grant, consummate leaders both, were very well aware of the high stakes of this meeting, and so each man moved to stake out a position. Lee sought at Appomattox to turn military defeat into moral victory. In his view, the war, which was brought on by extremism, 
had cost America dearly, and the country was, the, the uh, peace was rather, an opportunity for the country to, as Lee put it, obliterate the war's grievous effects and restore to the country what it had lost, the civic virtue Lee associated with the promising days of the early republic before the Union's fall from grace. For Lee, the surrender was a negotiation in which he secured honorable terms for his blameless men, and the peace was contingent on the North's good behavior. The Union victory in Lee's eyes was a victory of might over right. How are we doing on volume now, folks? Are we okay? Okay. Grant's position was diametrically opposed to Lee's. In Grant's view, the Federal Army's triumph flowed from the superior virtue of its cause. In Grant's view, the surrender was, in no sense, a negotiation. Grant's mercy to the defeated Confederates was designed not to exonerate them, but to effect their repentance. And Grant believed that he could be merciful at Appomattox precisely because he had rendered Lee utterly powerless and his cause discredited and hopeless. For Grant, the Union victory was one of right over wrong, not might over right, and the peace was contingent on the South's good behavior. These competing visions, I'll argue this morning, were, would exert a profound influence over post-war politics, but these two iconic men didn't craft the surrender terms in isolation. As the Appomattox drama unfolded, their countrymen and women would literally crowd the scene and invest the surrender with their own agendas, their own aspirations and dreams. And these dreams included the dream of freedom itself. In the eyes of African-American soldiers in the USCT and former slaves in Virginia and across the South, more than the Union was vindicated on April 9, 1865, for them, Lee's surrender was a freedom day, the moment the promise of emancipation was finally fulfilled. So I'll propose then this morning that three distinct understandings of the surrender took shape in the armies on April 9. The, uh, an interpretation that focused on restoration, a turning back of the clock, that's Lee's interpretation, an interpretation that focused on vindication, Grant's view, and an interpretation that focused on liberation. Lee's view with its nostalgia for the past, I'll argue, was utterly incompatible with the victors' interpretations, with their emphasis on change and progress. And I'll suggest, too, that the debates over Appomattox reveal not only the enduring bitterness between the two uh, sides, victors and vanquished, but also, perhaps surprisingly, deep divisions within each society, North and South. We shouldn't think of North or South as monoliths. I'm going to start with the Confederate interpretation. We'll begin on April 8, in the midst of Lee's desperate retreat across the central Virginia countryside. He pens a letter to Grant in response to Grant's suggestion that the Confederate cause was hopeless and the time had come to capitulate. This famous exchange of letters between the two men, many of you familiar with, I'm sure. Lee writes to Grant on April 8, quote, To be frank, I do not think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender of this army. But as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all, I desire to know whether your proposals would lead to that end. I cannot therefore meet you with the view to surrender the Army of Northern Virginia, but as far as your proposal may tend to the restoration of peace, I should be pleased to meet you. Lee uses this word restoration twice in this letter, and he begins by using that word to elaborate his vision of an honorable defeat, an honorable peace. So what does Lee mean by restoration? Restoration was, of course, a favorite theme, a familiar word in, in wartime politics, a favorite theme of the Northern Peace Democrats, Lincoln's opponents in the North, who deplored Lincoln's conduct of the war, particularly at emancipation, and who sought to restore the Union to the way it was. This was their campaign slogan in 1864. What does this have to do with Lee? Well, as most of you will know, Lee had hoped, many Confederates had hoped, that Confederate battlefield victories would swell the chorus of Northern dissent, that these Northern peace Democrats or Copperheads might displace the Lincoln administration, uh, kick Lincoln out, and be willing uh, to come to the negotiating table with the Confederates, perhaps even to concede Confederate independence. But Lee's own understanding of restoration was also distinct from that of the Northern Democrats, and it was rooted in Lee's family culture and in that of his native Virginia. Like many other Virginians of his generation, Lee was steeped 
in nostalgia for the days of the early republic. The days when the other states almost took it for granted that Virginia would be their leader. The days when Virginians felt a proprietary pride in the Union, Virginia the mother of all states. For Lee, an honorable peace would restore to the South, and here I'm quoting him, the prosperity and influence he associated with the halcyon days of an imagined past before the nation had drifted away from the principles of the Virginia founders, before, as Lee saw it, abolitionists had imbued African Americans with false hopes of freedom and equality. At this moment, in April of 1865, Lee doesn't seek the restoration of slavery. He knows that's not possible but he certainly seeks the preservation of the South's racial hierarchy. From April 1865 on, restoration will be Lee's political keyword, and we see this word crop up again and again and again in his post-war correspondence. For example, six months after the surrender, Lee writes his friend Matthew Fontaine Maury the following lament about what had been and might again be. He writes, quote, as long as virtue was dominant in the Republic, so long was the happiness of the people secure. May an ever merciful God save us from destruction and restore us to the bright hopes and prospects of the past. This was a fundamentally backward looking view of the peace. Now Lee's hopes for restoration were premised not only on nostalgia, but on the case that his army was blameless. And as you all will know, he elaborated that case on April 10 in his famous farewell address drafted under his guidance by his aide Charles Marshall. And that address began famously after four years of arduous service marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. Confederate troops had remained steadfast to the last, Lee continued, and could draw satisfaction even in this bitter hour of defeat from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed. Now Lee's farewell address immediately took on an iconic status. It rang true for his men, his starving and exhausted troops. To them, the Yankee army seemed endless and encompassing. But Lee's farewell address was also a political document. It had layers of meaning and deep tangled roots. For white Southerners, the reference to overwhelming numbers and resources was a sort of code in the context of pro-slavery ideology of the secessionist creed, of uh, Confederate creed, numbers conjured up a northern army of mercenaries and hirelings who had been uh, uh, seduced or coerced into service and had no real moral stake in the fight. Southern image of the northern army. Resources conjured up images of northern factories and cities in which an exploited underclass churned out the material of war at the behest of rapacious capitalists, a southern view of the industrializing north. Secessionists had seen the burgeoning wealth and population of the north as an indictment of, southern, of northern society, of its social instability and obsession with the bottom line. The farewell address is reference to the unsurpassed courage and fortitude of Confederate troops was part and parcel of this same indictment of the North. Defenders of the Southern way of life had long made a staple of the claim that Southern men accustomed to mastery and rural ways were made of sterner stuff than Northern wage slaves, factory hands and clerks and so on. Lee was a sophisticated man. He was well aware of this ideological freight. And in implying that the Union troops had not been the equals of the Confederate ones in the essential attributes of manhood, Lee's farewell address was making a political statement. By denying the legitimacy of the North's military victory, Confederates could deny the North the right to impose its political will on the South in the post-war period. Denying the legitimacy of the North's victory, it had been a victory of might over right in Lee's view. At Appomattox, Lee moved on a second front to cast the surrender terms in the best possible light. Hoping their paroles could confer on his men a measure of immunity from reprisals at the hands of the victorious Federals, Lee requested of Grant at their April 10 meeting, they had a brief meeting on horseback the day after the surrender, Lee requested of Grant that each individual Confederate be issued a printed certificate signed by a Union officer, a parole certificate, as proof that such a soldier came under the settlement of April 9. And Grant readily acceded to this request. In keeping with the language of the surrender terms that the two men had come to, a parole certificate vouched 
that if a surrendered soldier in the Army of North Virginia observed the laws in force where he resided, he was to, quote, remain undisturbed, unquote. Now, remember those words, because they're going to loom large as I move forward. Remain undisturbed. Now, Union men imagined that these certificates would remind Confederates of the obligations attendant upon their status as paroled prisoners of war. That's what they were, the obligation to, remain, to obey the laws and force where they resided. But Confederates would emphasize the remain undisturbed clause in these paroles. In, in their eyes, the paroles represented the promise that honorable men would not be treated dishonorably. In the Confederate interpretation, in other words, the surrender terms imposed conditions on the North. And we see Lee give voice to this interpretation on April 29, 1865. He gives an interview with the New York Herald. This is just a few weeks after the surrender, mind you. And in this interview, he tells a northern reporter that if, quote, arbitrary or vindictive or revengeful policies were adopted by the Republican administration, southerners would consider the surrender terms breached and would renew the fight. Ten months later, Lee is brought before a congressional committee to testify uh, on the state of affairs in the South, the waves of anti-black violence in the post-war South. And in that interview before Congress, that testimony, Lee defends the lenient policies of Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, then president, policies which had brought ex-Confederates back to power. And Lee again cautioned that the North must be restrained in its approach to reunion, magnanimous to the defeated Confederates, for that was the best way, Lee tells this congressional committee, for Northerners to regain the good opinion of the South. The main point here is this. Lee has a reputation in the modern day for having counseled resignation to defeat, accept the situation, he says to white Southerners. But for Confederates in the immediate post-war period, Lee was not a symbol of submission. He was a symbol of measured defiance. Not of submission, but of measured defiance. And indeed, Confederate civilians imagined the very surrender scene as an enactment of Lee's superiority to Grant. Again, we have a battle for the moral high ground here in the aftermath of the war. A revealing if fa fanciful report on the conference at the McLean House circulated through Confederate newspapers in late April of 1865. It appeared in a whole slew of newspapers. This is an account of the meeting at the McLean House purporting to be a truthful one, uh, but that's in, in, in instead of fabrication. And in this account, Lee offers Grant his sword in the McLean House, and Grant refuses to take it. And according to this newspaper account, Grant turns to Lee and says, General Lee, Keep that sword. You have won it by your gallantry. You have not been whipped, but overpowered, and I cannot receive it as a token of surrender from so brave a man. Now, of course, U.S. Grant never said any such thing to Robert E. Lee. But the report seemed credible to Confederates because it affirmed the might over right interpretation. Confederate diarist Emma Holmes wrote of the surrender scene that the Union officers cheered for Lee as he left the McLean house, and that the rank-and-file Yankees dared not utter a single insulting word to the defeated rebels. Why were the Yankees so reticent, even submissive in victory? Holmes explained, quote, they feared the lion even in chains. Lee the lion. They feared the lion even in chains. In the Confederate imagination, Lee is still commanding the respect and deference of Northerners even at the moment of defeat. In the year after the war, Confederates not only again and again invoked the overwhelming numbers interpretation of their defeat, they also invoked the Appomattox terms, and particularly that remain undisturbed clause. And they invoked it as a shield against social change and a weapon in a looming battle over black civil rights. Republican efforts to give the freed people a measure of equality and opportunity and protection were met by Confederate protests that such a radical agenda was a betrayal of the Appomattox terms, that the prospect of black citizenship, as one Virginia newspaper put it, quote, molests and disturbs us. In short, Confederates believed that Lee had drawn a line in the sand at Appomattox. The North Carolina poet Mary Bayard Clark put it most succinctly. Urging Southerners to model their behavior on that of Lee, she wrote in the summer of 1866 that Lee had, quote, not stooped his grandly proud head one hair's breadth since he surrendered to Grant, 
Confederates would observe their parole terms, but more than this, she said, an honorable enemy should not desire. It is idle to attempt to force them to say and feel that they were wrong, for they were right. The Confederate interpretation in a nutshell. Now, it won't surprise you to learn, to know, that from the start, this view of things was resoundingly rejected by U.S. Grant and by his inner circle and by the vast majority of Union soldiers and civilians. It was precisely an admission of wrongdoing and a change of heart that Grant sought from his defeated foes. Lee's rhetoric of restoration, nostalgia turning back the clock, held no charm for Grant. Indeed, Grant, in expressing his support for Lincoln in the 1864 election, had publicly and explicitly rejected the equation of peace and restoration. Grant associated that kind of language with defeatism, the defeatism of the Copperhead Democrats and the specter, as Grant put it, of the restoration to the South of slaves already freed. Grant also rejected the notion that he had, in any sense, negotiated with Robert E. Lee at Appomattox. In Grant's view, he had all the cards on April 9, 1865. Grant felt the meaning of the surrender terms to be unmistakable. I never claim that the paroles gave these prisoners any political rights whatsoever, Grant wrote in the spring of 1866. I thought that was a matter entirely with Congress over which I had no control. In other words, the fraught questions raised by the surrender, would these surrendered Confederates again be permitted to vote, to hold office? Would they have property other than slave property restored to them? As Grant saw it, these were questions to be decided in the civil realm by politicians and elected officials, not things for a general to decide. Surrender by parole was a military convention. The terms in Grant's mind rested on military calculations. Grant felt certain on April 9, 1865, that if Lee surrendered, all the other rebel armies would surrender and we would thus avoid bushwhacking and a continuation of the war, as Grant put it. And he was right, of course, the other dominoes fall after Lee's surrender. In Grant's mind, in the Union interpretation, the terms didn't set Lee's men free unconditionally. Their freedom as paroled prisoners of war was entirely contingent on their good behavior. The surrender was, for Grant, a vindication on many levels. He was keenly aware that over the course of the war, many Northerners, Northerners, mind you, in the Union Army, the government, the press, had attributed to the formidable Lee almost superhuman abilities, as Grant puts it somewhat bitterly in his memoirs. Grant knew all along that the rebel chief was mortal, and of course the surrender vindicated Grant in that knowledge. Moreover, Grant had long been stung by the charge leveled at him by the Copperhead press that he, Grant, was a merciless butcher who fruitlessly sent men to their deaths. Grant felt undisguised contempt for these stay-at-home traitors, as he called the Copperheads. Now with Lee's defeat, with Grant's show of leniency, this mantle of butcher would fall from Grant's shoulders. He had won and he had shown mercy and victory. More than anything, the surrender in Grant's eyes was the triumph of a just cause, namely the cause of union. The North's triumph vindicated the principle of rule by the majority. It vindicated the founder's belief in a perpetual union. It vindicated the capacity of citizen soldiers representing democracy to outfight the conscripts and dupes of an autocratic society, the northern view of the rebel army. The downfall of the Confederacy unburdened the South and the nation of slavery, an institution abhorrent to all civilized people not brought up under it, as Grant put it. Now the way was open, as Grant saw it, for the Union's ethos of moral and material progress to make its way into the South, the mass of white Southerners could be disenthralled from their subservience to the slaveholding elite. Grant did not believe Lee and his men to be blameless. Grant believed instead, as he put it, I quote him, that for every sin there must be a chance at atonement. For every sin there must be a chance at atonement. And Grant's magnanimity was designed to effect that atonement. Grant made no concessions to the Confederates, in other words, in his magnanimous terms, in his own mind, in that of uh, most people in the Union, this was the generosity of a conqueror whose victory was total. Now, Grant's view of the surrender as a triumph of right over wrong proved just as resonant and enduring among Northerners as Lee's might over right interpretation did among white Southerners. 
Surprisingly, this is a little counterintuitive for us, but many Northern troops felt that they and Grant had been the underdogs in this contest, coming up against the fabled uh, 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 Robert E. Lee and the, and the sort of flower of the Confederate Army. Union soldiers did not believe that their victory was attributable to material resources and brute force. They believed that it was attributable to their own superhuman effort, as one infantryman put it, and to divine providence. They believed that, in the end, God had favored the righteous uh, in, this, in this war. And indeed, the, the very sort of timing and setting of the surrender contributed to that. A strange providence was surely at work, an army chaplain uh, in the Fifth Corps Union surmised, in the fact that the surrender terms were signed at the home of a man, Wilmer McLean, who had owned a house on the battleground of Manassas, the site of the first rebel victory. How wondrous the divine retribution, uh, wrote Roe. Divine favor was also to be found in the date of the surrender, Palm Sunday. Uh, for Union soldiers, it was the universal expression, Roe wrote, that the surrender was a blessed Sabbath's work. Now, among those Northerners who embraced Grant's policy of magnanimity were abolitionists and radical Republicans. It was charged at the time, mind you, by Confederates and by Copperhead Democrats that radicals were intent on vengeance against the defeated Confederates, but the evidence suggests otherwise. In the eyes of influential abolitionists like Horace Greeley, a popular newspaper editor, magnanimity to the defeated rebels was the means to achieve a sacred purpose, namely the ascent of the South to emancipation. In other words, many Northerners, including abolitionists, saw Grant's magnanimity as an emblem of the moral superiority of the North and of the free labor system. Uh, indeed, Grant's victory and his magnanimity proved, as Greeley wrote, that a civilization based on free labor is of a higher and more humane type than that based on slavery. Greeley also wrote, revealingly, quote, I want as many rebels as possible to live to see the South rejuvenated and transformed by the influence of free labor. In Greeley's mind, there was no fitter fate for the likes of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee than to have to live in the brave new world that the surrender had brought about, to have to bear witness to an unfolding social revolution. In essence, Northerners who embraced Grant's terms said to the South, we don't want to inflict further punishment. We want you to change. And Confederates responded that the demand for change was a form of punishment, that any demand for change was inherently punitive and therefore a breaking of the Appomattox Covenant, if you will. And it's important to remember that this contest over the surrender's terms didn't simply pit the South against the North or even the Confederacy against the Union. Instead, it pitted those who favored a thoroughgoing social transformation of the South against those who rejected such a transformation. So we have here the theme of divisions within each society. I've already alluded to divisions within the North between the Republicans and the Copperhead Democrats. These Copperhead Democrats, the self-styled conservatives of the North, were loath for Lincoln's party, the hated Republican party, to treat the surrender as a mandate and as a vindication. And so these Democrats rallied behind the Confederate interpretation of Appomattox. As a Copperhead a newspaper, the New York World, put it, in their valor, their endurance, and their martial skill, Southerners were equal to the North. The Confederacy was subdued by overwhelming numbers. In other words, not by Lincoln's skill, not by the Republicans' excellent handling of the war effort, et cetera, eager to deny a mandate to their political opponents. The South, too, was divided. White Southern Unionists, a beleaguered minority that had opposed the Confederacy during the war, rallied behind Grant's interpretation and reveled in the fact that the noble Grant and his army had brought Lee to heel. In the year after the surrender, the dominant Union interpretation came to incorporate an argument about the lost promise of Appomattox, the betrayal of the true spirit of Grant's magnanimity. And for Grant and his followers, this betrayal of the true spirit of Appomattox, the, the arch betrayer, if you will, was President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor. Johnson, in the eyes of Grant and many Northerners, had capitulated to Lee's idea that peace must bring the restoration of power to elite white Southerners. Confronted with the foolhardiness, as he put it, of the far too lenient Johnson, and the blindness, as he put it, of the Southern people to their own interests, Grant adapted after the war. He would write in his memoirs, I gradually worked up to the point where I favored immediate enfranchisement for freed black men. 
And this was not a position he had espoused during the war, even at the, uh, right at the war's end. This was a position he, he came to uh, embrace. And he embraced it because he reckoned, as he would explain in his memoirs, this was the only way, black suffrage, the only way to dispel the ex-Confederates' pretension that they would be able to control the nation again and were entitled to do so. Grant, in other words, was deeply disturbed by what he uh, saw unfolding in the post-war South in the immediate period, uh, uh, immediate post-war period, and deeply disturbed, too, by Lee's refusal to give the victors their due, and perhaps the most surprising thing I found in my research, surprising to me as I, as I was learning this story, was an interview Grant gave about a year after the surrenders uh, uh, itself, of, uh, shortly after the anniversary, May 1866. He gives this interview with the Northern newspaper. And in this interview, Grant says that Lee was, quote, behaving badly, unquote. Grant tells the interviewer Lee was, and I quote Grant again, setting an example of forced acquiescence so grudging and pernicious in its effects as to be hardly realized. An example of forced acquiescence so grudging and pernicious in its effects as to be hardly realized. This hardly accords with the image of a gentleman's agreement between these two men in a meeting of the minds at Appomattox. What is Grant referring to here? Lee, it, it, it's important to note, hadn't gotten out on the uh, political stump and been overtly uh, uh, political. He'd, he'd sort of uh, made a few uh, public gestures after the war. This is as much a comment as the way Lee was perceived and still feared uh, as anything else. Grant resented Lee for denigrating the Union victory as a mere show of force. Grant resented the might over right argument. Grant resented Lee for subtly encouraging Confederates to resist change in the name of restoration. Grant, in other words, was very far apart from Lee at the moment of the surrender, and they grew farther apart in the year after the war. And Grant learned in that difficult year after the war that he would need to enter the political arena himself to finish the work he'd begun on April 9, 1865. Now I'll turn to the third of the three interpretations I want to sketch out here, and then I'll ask for questions. No Americans hoped more keenly or asserted more fervently that the surrender marked a new era than African Americans. For them, the Union victory vindicated the cause of black freedom and of racial justice. At Appomattox, African Americans had been both liberators and the liberated. In this famous last clash of Grant and Lee at the end of the desperate chase across the Virginia countryside from the trenches of Petersburg and Richmond to Appomattox. Lee's army had tried on the morning of April 9, before the white flags go up, had tried to break free of a federal trap, only to find that its last escape route was blocked by black soldiers in blue, six regiments of the United States colored troops, with one other waiting in the wings. When they heard confirmation of Lee's capitulation, the black troops' exaltation knew no bounds. They shouted, danced, and sang, and embraced each other with exuberant joy, a white Union private observed. Now, these black regiments at Appomattox were a microcosm of African-American life. They included Southerners, ex-slaves, who had run from plantations and farms and joined the Union Army, men trained at places like Kentucky's Camp Nelson. They included free blacks, men who had never been slaves. Uh, from cities in the north who trained at places like Philadelphia's Camp William Penn. They included men who would become prominent race leaders in the post-war era, such as the renowned historian George Washington Williams. It, as it so happens, the most eminent African-American historian of the late 19th century was in uh, the USCT at Appomattox as a teenager who had joined the Union Army, and he left a, a very extended accounts of that moment. They included a Baptist editor named William J. Simmons, who would go on to become the journalistic mentor to none other than Ida B. Wells, the famous anti-lynching crusader. They included a descendant of the Hemings family of Monticello. Fascinating stories here in the ranks among these USCT men. For all of these soldiers, regardless of their backgrounds, their presence on the battlefield was itself the culmination of a long struggle. We know this from the movie Glory and uh, many wonderful books. The Federal Army had initially turned away black volunteers on the grounds that African American men didn't possess the requisite attributes of patriotism and courage. But black troops had kept faith that the war was their golden moment. Uh, and when USCT regiments finally got their chance to fight, they proved their mettle at dozens of engagements. The regiments at Appomattox, to give an example, had seen considerable action. 
The 8th USCT was there at Appomattox. It had been initiated into combat at Olusti, Florida, had joined in the grinding warfare of the Overland Campaign in Virginia, and had manned the trenches through the siege of Petersburg, entering that city uh, in triumph when it fell uh, in early April of 1865. Now, African-American soldiers were keenly aware that even after giving all this proof of their courage, their march towards equality could still be turned back so long as there were powerful Confederate armies in the field. The Confederate government viewed all black Union soldiers as so many rebellious slaves liable to be enslaved or executed if captured. Black soldiers were aware, too, that many white Northerners viewed their enlistment as a social experiment testing the capacity of blacks for citizenship, and that some of those, uh, those white northerners hoped and expected that the experiment would, in the end, fail. So not surprisingly, given this context, African American soldiers quickly seized on the USCT's critical role in Lee's surrender as a vindication. As William McCausland of the 29th Regiment USCT put it in a May 1865 letter, quote, we the colored soldiers have fairly won our rights by loyalty and bravery. Many of these men's white officers and comrades in arms shared the conviction that the USCT's role in the last battle had been decisive. For example, a cavalryman with Sheridan, a man named Lumen Tenney, wrote a letter to his mother and sisters on April 10, recounting the scene on the morning of the 9th for them, and this is what he wrote about that last critical fighting on the morning of the 9th. Quote, the morning came, the cavalry was being pushed back rapidly towards the station. The boys were falling, scores of them. Why was it with victory so near? When over the hill, a dark column was espied coming down the road in close column at quick time. What a relief from the awful suspense. What cared we for the color or race of those men so long as they brought relief to us? we saw courage and determination in their cold black faces. Moreover, black troops understood themselves to be an army of liberation whose defeat of Lee was a nail in the coffin of slavery itself. And abundant evidence exists to suggest that slaves saw Appomattox as a freedom day for many, many slaves. April 9, 1865, not January 1st, 1863, was the de facto moment of emancipation. For as long as Confederates controlled the South, there was no real freedom. And we see testimony to this effect in many different kinds of sources. Virginia slaves naturally are the first to hear the tidings of the surrender to fathom its significance. None other than Booker T. Washington and his famous autobiography, Up From Slavery, remembers that he first hears the Emancipation Proclamation read uh, after Lee's surrender, when a Union arm officer comes to his corner of southwest Virginia and announces his deliverance. We also can reconstruct African American views of this critical moment from uh, 2,000 some interviews that were conducted in the 20th century with people who had been alive before the Civil War, African Americans who had memories of living in slavery, these so-called WPA interviews named after the New Deal agency that, that uh, gathered them. And these interviews echo reminiscences like Washington's. Uh, Fannie Berry, for example, a slave in Pamplin, Virginia, remembered that uh, members of her community burst into spontaneous song when they learned that Lee had raised the white flag, for at that moment, they knew they were free. For some former slaves, the date of Lee's surrender structured their very sense of time and of history. Eliza Washington told her WPA interviewer, S.S. Taylor, quote, the first thing I remember was living with my mother about six miles from Scott's Crossing in Arkansas in the year 1866. I know it was 1866 because it was the year after the surrender, and we all knew the surrender was in 1865. That's how history comes into focus for her. And just as Appomattox persists in the memory of many ex-slaves, it's an enduring presence in the commemorative calendar of the freed people. We start to see Surrender Day festivities begin April 9, 1866, first in southern communities, but, but eventually all over the country. And I found evidence of African-American communities, churches in particular, celebrating April 9 well into the 20th century, communities in Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, and so on. It's a big uh, a, a day on the commemorative calendar. The fact that black soldiers had defeated, helped to defeat Lee's army, lent additional symbolic meaning to the surrender. For these men, Lee and his army of Northern Virginia typified the haughty slaveholding elite and its pretense of racial superiority. And so according to Thomas Morris Chester, a newspaper correspondent, African-American, uh, embedded with the Army of the James, the Confederate capitulation was especially sweet 
because it was a rebuke to the FFVs, or First Families of Virginia, whom he wryly dubbed after the surrender, fleet-footed Virginians. In short, men like Williams made and then sustained the claim that in defeating Lee's army, African-American troops had dealt a death's blow to all that army stood for. And judging by the WPA interviews, the comportment of Lee and Grant themselves and the theme of magnanimity figured prominently in the black folklore of Appomattox. As by way of background, I should note that an enduring myth of the surrender was that Grant and Lee met and negotiated the peace under an apple tree in an orchard outside the village of Appomattox. It's not what happened, but this image uh, uh, arose and became popular, was popularized by engravers and lithographers who turned out prints of Grant and Lee under the apple tree. And this piece of folklore appears in African-American accounts. A former slave named Jeff Stanfield of Virginia claimed in his WPA narrative that Lee and Grant had met up under an apple tree and kissed and rode off to Richmond together. <laughs> Most important, African-American uh, soldiers' interpretations of the surrender tried to inscribe a civil rights message into the magnanimous terms of the surrender. They emphasized, black veterans did, men like George Washington and Williams, they emphasized the promise of, a map of Appomattox and depicted the freed people and black soldiers in particular as agents of national healing. So Williams in his landmark 1888 History of the Negro Troops in the War of the Rebellion praised black soldiers for treating the vanquished Confederates with quiet dignity and Christian humility. He wrote, after the Confederate Army had been paroled, the Negro troops cheerfully and cordially divided their rations with the late enemy and welcomed them at their campfires on the march back to Petersburg. The sweet gospel of forgiveness was expressed in the black soldiers' interaction with the ex-rebel soldiers who freely mingled with the black conquerors. It was a spectacle of magnanimity never before witnessed. Now, this was a, a somewhat rosy view of, of, of events, but it's very, very important what Williams is doing here. At this moment, Williams is trying to counter a very long-standing argument, anti-abolition argument, that anti-abolitionists in the North and South had been making since the 18th century. And it was the argument that you could not have emancipation because if you had emancipation, you would have race war and chaos and vengeance. And abolitionists had been arguing for decades, no, the problem is slavery, not abolition. And if you have emancipation, you'll have your only real chance at harmony. And there won't be war. There'll be harmony and brotherhood and fellowship. Williams here is picking up that thread, trying to counter this charge that emancipation would bring social chaos. In Williams's view, black magnanimity at Appomattox was an exercise of moral authority, a conscious effort, as purposeful as Grant's own act of clemency to Lee to break a cycle of violence, the cycle of violence that slaveholders had so long perpetuated. But could the cycle be broken? African Americans who invoked Appomattox as a signifier of hope were fighting a rearguard action against a determined foe. In the decade after the war, defeated Southerners began to elaborate the lost cause tradition, a mythology that romanticized the Old South and the Confederacy, demonized radical reconstruction as corrupt and punitive, and justified, sought to justify vigilante violence as a legitimate means to restore the old order. By emphasizing the essential heroism and nobility of all white soldiers, those in gray and in blue, the lost cause mythology fused white supremacy and sectional reconciliation. Now, needless to say, for champions of the lost cause mythology, there were no black heroes in the Appomattox story. There was no liberation from tyranny. There was no promise of interracial reconciliation. As I suggested earlier, Unreconstructed rebels interpreted that key line in Grant's surrender terms, the stipulation that paroled Confederate soldiers would remain undisturbed by US authorities. They interpreted that as a promise, the promise that although slavery was defunct, the racial caste system would remain undisturbed. And no one did more to press that argument than John Brown Gordon, a former general in Lee's army. In 1861, Gordon, a Klansman and future U.S. Senator and Governor, was summoned to testify before a joint committee of Congress investigating the condition of affairs in the South. And in his testimony, Gordon again and again and again invoked the Appomattox terms. He said, quote, we should not be disturbed so long as we obeyed the laws. This was the pledge, Gordon said, that Grant had made to the Confederates. And peace would have come swiftly and surely, Gordon continued, if radical Republicans had not betrayed that promise, the spirit of Appomattox, by telling Confederates, quote, 
your former slaves are better fitted to administer the laws than you are, unquote. Gordon's message was clear. The only way to restore the peace was to leave the White South alone to manage its own affairs. And here again, with this, we have the theme of divisions within each society. Northerners opposed to racial equality and black suffrage and other Republican uh, agenda for Reconstruction joined with Southerners like Gordon in arguing that radical Reconstruction was a blight upon the apple tree of Appomattox, as one Democratic paper put it, and that only by forsaking radicalism could the North be reconciled to the South. Faced with the malevolent power of the lost cause mythology to renew the cycle of violence, African Americans adopted an alternative, more somber interpretation of the surrender as we move into the late 19th century. Some insisting that Grant had perhaps been too lenient, that the spirit of Southern defiance had sur survived the surrender intact. In 1912, with the lost cause cult at a peak of popularity, an article in the African American newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, lamented that Southern thought is conquering the entire country on the race question. And the article quoted a poem called Appomattox by an African-American poet, Charles Dinkins. And in this poem, Dinkins has Lee address his army, his defeated army, with the following charge. Lee says, quote, when falls the sword, the better way becomes the soldier's part to play. The South will whip the North someday with ink and pen. Lee's prophecy, the article noted, had come to pass. The unrepentant South had struck down the doctrine of social equality. It whipped the North with ink and pen and revolutionized the sentiment and practices of the North, as uh, the courier put it. In short, for African Americans, no less than for whites, Appomattox came to represent lost promise, in this case, a betrayal of the promise of freedom, a betrayal both by those whites who rejected black citizenship and by those who gave up the fight for it. However compelling and comforting the image of the surrender as a gentleman's agreement may be, it doesn't begin to capture this complex legacy of Appomattox. Deep into the 19th century, Appomattox was at the heart of the politics of race and reunion. Thank you. We have a couple, yeah, we have, do we have a couple minutes for questions. A fellow Virginian, yes. always glad to see that. Don't we see a continuation of the contest uh, between the, the uh, different interpretations today, especially with the argument over the uh, Confederate battle flag, where uh, proponents are, of the flag are saying that uh, it, it represents the soldiers, not slavery, and opponents saying they fought for slavery and, and also bringing in the uh, civil rights struggle and, and it being used as a symbol against it, uh, and African Americans extending the extending it beyond the flag itself to include Confederate memorials as well? It, that's a great question. Do we have echoes in the modern day of these 19th century debates? We absolutely do. Um, you know, my inclination as a historian of the 19th century is to not try to draw lines that are too unbroken from the Civil War to the present day because the complicated 20th century intervenes and, and, and our story takes so many twists and turns. And, and the 19th century, I think, in many ways, for me, what's compelling about it is, is that it, it, it seems familiar, but is really very different and very remote from us and difficult to understand. So we, 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 have, to, you know, we have to sort of tread with, with caution. But these issues, what you're getting at in some ways is, the, is the, uh, the persistent power of that cluster of lost cause ideas uh, in, in, in our culture. And, and, and I think that we have, um, as a culture, not thought enough about what union men must have felt and what this all must have looked like and felt like through their eyes and an and a, and a unwillingness on the part of Confederates to concede that Northerners had fought with skill and bravery was something that, um, again, as I tried to suggest when I quoted Grant, rankled uh, and, and it's just one of many signs that there was always pushback against the lost cause. The other thing I would caution against, I think, sometimes we have a tendency to think that the lost cause mythology just swept aside all the other stories that one might tell about this period. And I would argue, and I think a number of people have been tr uh, kind of working this theme recently at, among Civil War scholars, that there are counter narratives. The African American story I've told is one of those counter narratives. And it's never entirely displaced by the lost cause mythology. However powerful it may be, a, a, a one cause 
uh, 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 sort of view of the war that's, that's perpetuated by Union soldiers and by GAR regiments and by Union commemorations. That's another important counterweight. So the fascinating thing for us is to see how these competing interpretations have, have, uh, have, have uh, interlaced and are there modern day echoes to be sure. Any other questions? Uh, do you believe, in your opinion, were the surrender terms too lenient? And then was radical reconstruction the correct uh, answer? So uh, I don't think that the surrender terms were too lenient. The thing we have to take into account is that Grant was acting with a mandate from Lincoln. I mean, Grant knew what Lincoln wanted. Lincoln, sometimes we say, ah, well, what would happen if Lincoln had lived? Well, we know what Lincoln wanted. Lincoln had, uh, had promulgated his own plan for amnesty and reconstruction in December of 1863, and he'd said famously in his second inaugural, malice towards non charity towards all. A hard war and a soft peace with justice was Lincoln's vision, and Grant believed that that's uh, what he was after. Grant... Um, Grant and Lincoln believed that the overriding purpose of the war was to make the Union whole again. And because the purpose was to bring those errant Southern brethren back into the fold, to change hearts and minds while doing so, it was never in the cards that there were going to be mass reprisals uh, in this setting. Because, because um, unless you managed to bring those errant brethren back in, you hadn't achieved your purpose. What Grant and Lincoln hoped was in keeping with a deep article of faith in the Republican Party. Most white Southerners did own slaves. Republicans knew this. They hoped that once you um, got the slaveholding elite, it's, it's thumb off the neck of those non-white slaveholding white Southerners, that the mass of Southern whites might be persuaded to embrace a free labor system and to embrace uh, the, a sort of northern way, if you will. Lincoln and Grant underestimated the devotion of those white Southern masses to Confederate principles and Confederate leaders, and so, um, uh, uh, in a sense, um, uh, Lincoln would have found what, what Johnson found, what, which was that there were efforts to preempt black suffrage and black civil rights from the very start. That, that all of that, that anti-reconstruction violence wasn't a reaction to radical reconstruction. It began the moment the war ended, preemptive efforts to make sure change wouldn't come.